turn it on. Get to the last slide. Okay, and with that, we're going to move on to today's topic. Today's presenter, Chris Bianco, is on the worldwide technical sales team for IBM's Cloud Data Services Group and advises customers on using Compose services for their apps. He's authored a few publications on database and analytics technology. And if you have any questions for him about today's topic or working with any of our other product offerings, please ask him in the GoToWebinar's question box, and we'll get to them at the end. And with that, Chris, I'm going to pass controls over to you. Cool. Thanks, John. Um, I'm just going to do a quick switcheroo, make sure that everything's going right with the broadcast. Uh, can you confirm that my screen's coming through? Yes, I see the backdrop. Backdrop. All right. Now I see your presentation. As long as nothing too alarming is coming up. <laughs> so, um, again, I'd like to welcome a good morning or good afternoon to everyone who's joined today's call. Uh, as John said today, we're going to focus on the approach that a developer would take towards building multi-database applications using Compose. And because of the acquisition with IBM, we now have two avenues with which our customers can approach that type of multi-database design. They can, of course, stick with the public offerings and multi-tenant deployments that we have through Compose and the way that you've done it traditionally for many years. Uh, but we also have a new licensing model with Compose Enterprise that offers some unique advantages in terms of licensing to the whole catalog of services as well as infrastructure that's provided for you and single tenant in terms of being fully isolated. So excellent for uh, production workload or ideal for sharing across multiple individuals within a larger organization or multiple teams within a very large company. So with that, we're going to dive into how we can utilize Compose in approaching that type of multi-database design. So and taking the mindset of a, a programmer or a developer, we're, of course, going to think in a type of polyglot model. Um, this is likely going to be a hybrid scenario that's incorporating the best pieces of open source, which, of course, Compose delivers to our customers daily. Um, we have very razor-sharp focused services that are ideal for caching, ideal for transactional database, ideal for more operational workloads. So the decision to go down the open source path, I think, is for many of us a very easy one. It's one that we're comfortable working with, and in, in particular on the Compose platform. Uh, but identifying what tool is correct for the job is not necessarily so simple. Um, as we had mentioned before, there's many opportunities to adopt different pieces of the catalog. Knowing which one is appropriate for your use case or your workload is something that we can be consultative at with IBM and with Compose in terms of giving you best practices and best, uh, best architectures of how they fit together. We have a wealth of customers, of course, that span the gamut of different types of industry, different types of organizations, from education to healthcare to tech to startups uh, that have utilized the Compose platform. And I would say, arguably, each of these has faced the same type of problem of uh, first initially deciding to go down the path of adopting open source and then tailoring that to a specific solution or a specific problem that you wish to solve. So as John mentioned at the top, we have today nine services that are part of the Compose catalog. Each of these can be spun up either individually or as part of a larger enterprise deployment. Uh, where the real value comes in is the ability to mix and match these across different uh, infrastructure pieces. So as John had mentioned at the top, we distribute equally across software, AWS, and Google Cloud Platform. And I think that's a very key consideration as well when you're looking to build a multi-database design that not necessarily every piece of your architecture is going to come from IBM or Compose. In fact, you might want to adopt other services that are part of AWS, or perhaps you have a customer base that's heavily invested in GCP. Uh, the flexibility of our platform allows you to accommodate those folks as we look to build out those hybrid solutions. But of course, it's not to exclude the possibility to interact and integrate with the enterprise software that comes from our new acquisition uh, via IBM. So like Compose, IBM has very razor-sharp focused solutions uh, around areas like operational data store, analytic warehouse, big data Hadoop solutions, or Apache Spark. Um, and being able to integrate these on the software platform with services that come from our Compose platform is really essential to many of our developers and many of our customers today. And later on in this presentation, we'll be walking through a type of mock architecture uh, discussing around a virtual reality headset data layer uh, that's going to integrate from pieces both from Compose at the top there as well as IBM Cloud Data Services at the bottom. 
and we can show you how these truly do interact in a hybrid sense to deliver something that is more than the sum of its parts. So in terms of a, a blueprint, if you were, again, going back to the developer mindset, uh, the first checkbox that you want to hit, which we've already chatted through, is that decision to enable an open architecture across multiple vendors, multiple platforms, and a variety of services. Uh, but then when you go to actually implementing the solution, the decision of which database to pursue or which service is appropriate for your workload is the second question to be addressed. And that's really a question around scoping. Uh, for any of you who have built, and I think we're all builders on this call today, scoping is certainly not easy. Uh, I think the first database selection is relatively simple. You're building an application, you're building a framework, you have a pretty solid understanding of what type of database you're going to need. If that's you know, SQL based, if it's a more relational uh, or transactional style engine, of course, you would go down that path. Um, and many of our customers that are building these types of multi-database solutions uh, start with one or two of the services that are in the Compose stack uh, at front of mind in terms of it, this is an obvious adoption that we're going to start on. Um, and that's really the scoping problem that's easy. Uh, what becomes challenging is when you want to expand beyond simply supporting a database or supporting a single service in, uh, in exchange for you know, adding more features, more functionality to your data layer, uh, building your application and making it more extensive or extensible, um, that's when you need to incorporate more pieces from the catalog, and that's really where the scoping challenge comes into play. Um, you can easily scope, I think, for one database across a single piece of architecture or hardware or infrastructure, uh, but once you need to adopt these over time, changing your workflow, changing your scope, um, that's when things become challenging. And that's in particular where a solution like uh, Compose comes into play. Now we have obviously, of course, a number of our customers that are using MongoDB today. Um, just to illustrate for those on the phone that are new to the platform, making that decision to include Mongo as part of that larger architecture stack through Compose versus through uh, an alternative, alternative vendor uh, is something that's quite easy to uh, talk to people about when it comes down to the speed of deployment. So for example, if we take deployment on MongoDB of, uh, on the Compose platform, it's about three pages worth of instruction set to get that deployed. Really, you just log into the dashboard, select the sizing of the system you want to deploy, and within a couple of minutes, it's spun it up to you according to that best practice configuration of the three nodes of high availability, the automated backups, all the features that our customers are pretty well versed in. Alternatively, if you're doing that through someone like Amazon, of course, they support the exact same data layer, the exact same MongoDB deployment that we do with Compose, but the steps to get there are not necessarily as simple. Uh, we took the instruction set from AWS and pieced together, uh, just going slide by slide here, a comparison of doing it on Compose versus doing it on AWS. You have about 30 odd slides with uh, AWS's procedure, doing it through a manual configuration of VPC versus the really automated workflow of Compose. So, of course, enrolling more databases into your architecture solution is very quick through the Compose platform. Our orchestration layer takes care of that and really eases uh, the burden for customers or folks that are perhaps not necessarily well versed in something like a Redis or a NetCD deployment or a RabbitMQ. Uh, we make that fairly easy and simple um, through our orchestration framework. So I think our platform, the way that it's structured, the way that we've architected Compose, really addresses the second problem that we have in this blueprint of a multi-database design where we have the scoping problem. Uh, we understand the scope is going to change rapidly over time, uh, and this will be an iterative process where we might make mistakes. We might try the database or service, find that it's not the best fit for us, but we want to operate within a flexible framework or a platform where we can easily you know, remedi remediate those changes uh, and change things on the fly so that we incorporate new databases or alternative solutions. So we first hit those first two deployment uh, requirements. The third one is when we get really big, now we're talking about multi-databases in the sense of each of these is perhaps hundreds of gigabytes, maybe even borderlining on the terabyte range, where infrastructure becomes a challenge. Um, perhaps when we were at step two, we anticipated that we would need quite a bit of data space, quite a bit of uh, RAM and CPU uh, performance behind our infrastructure. So we might provision a pretty large box, but as things change down the line, as we move from step one to step two, we incorporate a lot of pieces. Perhaps our throughput rates are much uh, higher than we anticipated. We might actually be garnering a ton of success with our application layer, and it's growing at a pace that we need to 
increase our infrastructure or increase our capacity to uh, accommodate that, uh, that groundswell of attention and demand. So that's where the infrastructure quandary comes in. If scoping is harder than scaling, in terms of infrastructure scaling, it's certainly harder. Now, the composed platform, of course, has elastic flexibility and scalability throughout every iteration of the product. So individual services that are provisioned through composed public are elastically scalable. Uh, you can simply, from the dashboard, negotiate how much additional RAM and CPU specs, for example, that you want underlying your composed service deployment, and then we will scale that out uh, in, in very rapid succession uh, to address that requirement change. But alternatively, if you want to deploy this into an isolated infrastructure through something akin to our composed enterprise deployments, we also offer a variety of deployment options and infrastructure specs uh, to alleviate those concerns that we have around infrastructure scale. So this chart is kind of giving you an overview of our platform our architecture. On the left-hand side is our front-end views. We have portals through the Compose.io front page as well as through the Bluemix console. Those under the covers are interacting with our shared orchestration layer that's sitting on AWS at that center uh, piece here on the chart. And that's a combination of multiple pieces, but to really drill it down and distill it, we have our governor layer, the Compose GRU, that's taking recipes or boilerplates for our services and negotiating that through RabbitMQ with the private infrastructure that you uh, provisioned on the right-hand side. That could be on AWS, could be software, could be GCP. Um, it could be those composed enterprise deployments or it could be composed public services. But in every case, uh, the interactions happening on the far left-hand side, the user submitted requests to scale, provision new databases, are all being passed through that orchestration layer in the center and then the resulting database or services are being provisioned automatically across three nodes on the private infrastructure that you have on the right-hand side. And of course, we're using containerization to make sure that everything is highly elastic in terms of scaling this out across the hardware that we provision it onto, isolating it with a VLAN, and just making sure, for example, that there's no one single point of failure on these services. Um, so when we talk about that composed enterprise model, uh, we have two tracks that people can buy this through. There's the, uh, of course, the multi-tenant path that we talked about before, and I think many of us are familiar with Compose Public, but the IBM Managed track has with it uh, an isolated infrastructure. So that right-hand piece that we looked at on the previous chart would be entirely dedicated to you as a customer. So from the infrastructure piece, we entirely take away the concern of will I have sufficient space over time to grow into. If you provision an IBM uh, Managed Compose Enterprise deployment, you know well in advance how much space you're going to have, and you can grow these into multi-terabyte ranges to accommodate as, uh, as requirements grow or as demand changes on your application layer. You have the infrastructure already set aside for you that you can comfortably build and expand within. Uh, in addition to that, and I think much more interesting to us as builders and developers is that the licensing model to the catalog also changes when you go down the Compose Enterprise path. Instead of licensing individual services, uh, you get the full catalog of composed services as part of one bill. So out of cart provisioning from Mongo, Postgres, Redis, whatever you require down the line today or tomorrow, uh, you are free to provision as many instances as you want of that service. And in any combination of scale or size, with the only constraint being that it fits within that infrastructure that you bought. So going back to that initial challenge that we had of scaling for infrastructure, if we have uh, infrastructure that's already pre-tuned and, and pre-set uh, for our future growth path, that's great. But also from accommodating the second component where scoping is hard and database requirements change over time, going down that composed enterprise license path allows you to not have to worry about licensing new databases later on. It's all part of that one catalog licensing fee. And so you can mix and match these without any kind of concern about the licensing costs or uh, what combination of services you'd like to use. I think in, in terms of scope and flexibility, it gives you that sweet spot of having the ability to change things on the fly, accommodate those changing requirements, but also have a very solid and steady infrastructure underlying it that is going to be you know, easily scoped ahead of time so that you don't run into a scenario where you run out of space or you have to scale uh, sooner than you thought. Now the Compose uh, Enterprise plans come in three uh, flavors. There's a starter configuration, the AWS, 
as well as transactional and large transactional on both SoftLayer and AWS. And I think anybody familiar with the Convos platform knows that we do that uh, ratio of scale of RAM or memory to disk. Uh, so for our in-memory caching services like Redis or RabbitMQ, it's a one-to-one. -one. With services like MongoDB, it's for every one gigabyte of RAM, 10 gigabytes of disk. Um, so within that deployment of transactional, for example, you have up to 640 gigabytes of MongoDB that you can deploy within that environment. But of course, as things move from left to right, requirements have changed over time. And we want to enroll more database services, different combinations of services, and reshape and rescale those as we uh, need to. And so this chart just illustrates that quickly. I think this makes much more sense when we bring it into a real-life architecture, and that's what we're going to be stepping into next. I think this is a, a pretty solid overview of the platform taken from both the public multi-tenant path as well as that dedicated enterprise path. Both of them accommodate the same type of multi-database design. Uh, it's really up to you and your organization to determine which path is appropriate uh, in terms of uh, scoping and scale out. And we'll have the opportunity as well, of course, at the end to ask additional questions. Uh, I think we're now about uh, 20 minutes in, and this would be an ideal time to really showcase this with uh, a real-life architecture. Again, a fictional use case, but one that we can easily accommodate with this type of architecture, this platform, and a combination of services that run on top of it. Um, so I'm a big fan of this chart. Uh, <laughs> IBM, of course, is a bit of a, a legacy customer, uh, certainly a, a well-known enterprise entity. And uh, we have a number of customers within our organization that are actively recruiting open source developers and open source technologies into their architecture stack in addressing completely new types of use cases or technologies that didn't exist you know, five, five, six years down the line. Uh, and one of those is around the idea of this Internet of Things device. In this case, we're talking about a virtual reality headset, uh, but really you could substitute this device with any type of you know, mobile phone, any type of connected device that has multiple sensors, multiple data feeds that are uh, running through it. Uh, and for every you know, customer that wants to build a data layer around this, they have to address multiple use cases and indeed multiple verticals of uh, workflow and data types. And in this case, we're going to identify, if we're thinking of something like a VR headset, there's likely going to be a gaming element around it. They'll have to support virtual reality games that are going to be projected from uh, either a mobile phone or from the mobile headset itself, uh, and then displayed for the user to interact with. So there'll be an operational data store likely behind this, more than likely a NoSQL engine that's going to be logging session data, uh, tracking achievement, unlocks and just generally um, allowing the user to save their progression throughout the game. Um, that's requirement number one. Requirement number two could be uh, microtransactions. These could be embedded within the game layer. Uh, you might want to unlock additional items or skills for a character. Uh, you may, from a store page, want to add extensions to your games, add-ons, expansions, and so on. Now, there's also going to be from the owner's perspective, whoever is running this data layer and providing the service to their customers, uh, the need to do analytics against both how people are utilizing the headset as well as their interactions within the game. Uh, that type of feedback, reporting, and visualizations against data and trends that are happening within your customer base are highly valuable from a marketing perspective, a sales perspective, and even from an engineering perspective. Uh, you may realize that there are certain quirks or bugs within the game that reveal themselves over time, and those trends are easily picked up on through some type of analytic reporting. And finally, uh, because we're using a headset device that has multiple sensors, accelerometers, uh, anything tracking movement or displacement of the device uh, is going to have some type of high throughput, high velocity data sensor attached to it. And the volume and speed at which this data is produced by those sensors is generally much larger than what we would like to comfortably land inside of, for example, an operational store or relational database. And that's where something like caching uh, or even a solution like Apache Spark could really start to shine. Um, so we're going to incorporate that sensor data coming out of the Internet of Things device, in this case, our VR headset. And that will be the fourth component, the fourth key layer of our data layer here. Um, so with that in mind, bringing this back to one of the charts that we looked at much earlier on, uh, remember at the top we had those nine services from Compose, and then we had in that discussion of hybrid the idea that we can intermingle and mix this with services from other vendors 
And in this case, we're going to look at some services from IBM Cloud Data Services. Um, and we have in the green, Compose, in the blue, IBM. And I've truncated these into separate buckets. And you can think of each of these four buckets as aligning to those four requirements that we had along the bottom. So there's an operational component in addressing our games layer. That could be something like MongoDB, could be Cloud and or SiloDB. There's transactional requirements in support of the storefront. We have the analytic layers in support of that reporting and visualization. And then finally, for the streaming and caching component, we could utilize something like Redis. We could use Infosphere Streams from IBM or Apache Spark from really any vendor uh, to address that type of caching scenario. Now, with those buckets and the idea of a multi-database design is that if I were to, as a developer, pick uh, one solution for every one of those four buckets, I would, in the end, come up with an architecture that's really complete. It's hybrid and it addresses as a mixture of both IBM and Compose services uh, every facet of those requirements that we had along the bottom. Now, I could choose any arbitrary combination of these that I'd like. Some of them are more suited uh, and better suited for certain use cases than others. Uh, but I think the philosophy remains the same, that choose one from each bucket, you should come out with some type of solution, some type of architecture that's going to address every requirement that we've already outlined uh, as a part of our earlier discussion. And when it comes to scope, when it comes to making that correct decision as to which database is appropriate, that's really where you can leverage uh, your friends at Compose or IBM to make those recommendations, uh, provide you some guidance as to best practices of where to first, uh, for example, substitute Cloud instead of Mongo, or use DashDB instead of MySQL. Um, we can certainly help you with that and encourage you at any point in time, if you do require that type of scoping and recommendation, uh, to give us a shout. Now, going back to that architecture, the first bucket uh, that we had was the operational front end. And from that, we selected Cloud. This is going to be supporting our mobile application layer. Uh, Quantum is a NoSQL document database, a schema entirely built around JSON, and really well attuned for even offline conditions, where, for example, you want to be able to interact with your application layer if you're on board a uh, flight or if your uh, phone is in airplane mode, you still have the ability to interact locally with the database, and then when that connection is brought back into full, uh, you have those changes made locally, replicated back to the Quantum cluster, and back to the mobile phone and vice versa. So Cloud is ideal for kind of filling our games component, the operational data layer. But of course, the microtransactions in that storefront require something a little bit more hardened in terms of acid compliance. And for that reason, we selected from the Compose catalog Postgres, which of course has a, a fantastic pedigree behind it. And this will easily satisfy uh, the logging and transactional and purchase uh, information that's attached to our game layer and to our storefront. Now, we also wanted to incorporate some type of analytics and reporting against, for example, how people were utilizing the mobile app. Uh, what were their preferences? What's their progress look like? Uh, anything attached to the session data is something that we as a developer organization would love to get better insight into. Now, Quadrant has a built-in schema discovery tool. It's essentially a migration process that allows you to take that NoSQL data, which is highly unstructured or highly variable in structure, and map it into a very tightly defined schema inside of an analytic warehouse. So uh, it really automates the process, bridges the gap between operational front end and hardened relational analytics by automating the process of migrating that schema out of cloud, and making it available inside of an analytic warehouse, inside of DashDB, and from that point, you can attach any type of reporting tool that you traditionally use. If you're using Tableau, we support that. If you are interested in geospatial elements that are coming out of that mobile app, we also support integrations with Esri, ArcGIS. So really, the, the options are, are uh, fairly extensive for you. And the connector here automates and, and really improves and eases that process of linking those two environments, NoSQL and Relational, together. So that satisfies our reporting element. Now, there's another reporting piece that may be of interest to a marketer or someone from sales. Uh, perhaps someone at the storefront is purchasing a lot of expansions, a lot of add-ons to their game, or perhaps a customer inside of the game layer has unlocked some new tier of achievement, or you know they've, they've become marked now as a, a, a high-value target, high-value customer to your marketing organization, 
and you want to give some type of a, re a reward or outreach, uh, really improve the experience of that individual that just reached that milestone. Um, something like RapidMQ from Compose could be attached to the Postgres environment, tracking those transactional uh, records, and if that milestone is hit, allow you to push uh, a notification to, for example, your marketing channel on Slack, uh, alerting you to that individual's progress, and then initiating uh, the next steps towards fulfilling uh, that customer's experience and really improving their overall impression of the product or the application. So that's a, a very simplistic kind of monitoring uh, style and notification style system, but one that we can easily incorporate with, you know, the simple addition of another service on the Compose catalog. And finally, for the IoT component, remember we've still got that headset somewhere down the line uh, pumping up those volumes of data, that fast throughput and, and large volumes. We need to cache that to really first uh, transform it and make it appropriate for data layers down the line. And that would be an ideal landing zone for something like Redis. We can cache it within Redis first and then apply transformation, some type of cleansing uh, inside of an analytics or Apache Spark service and then utilize the connector that we have between Spark and Cloudant, uh, and really this applies to any flavor of Spark in the marketplace, which allows you to, again, very easily uh, take the data that was transformed and massaged within Spark, cached within Redis, and push that into your cloud data layer. And now we've got data coming out of the VR headset available within our operational data store. That might be data that we feed directly into our application layer, as Cloudant is still powering that, but it also might be data that we want to push a little further down the line back into our analytic warehouse and dash db uh, to give additional feedback to the engineers or the developers that are attached to the VR headset uh, to ensure that the next iteration of the product, if there's any type of bug or any type of um, a discrepancy that we can detect through analytics, uh, the next iteration can be improved and our product set, both from the application layer standpoint as well as the hardware standpoint, uh, continues to improve with every uh, subsequent release. So that's a, a pretty heavy stack. Uh, again, very simplistic to tie this together, but incorporating so many different elements. We've got transactional, operational, analytics, big data, caching, uh, and asynchronous messaging, all within a single data layer, and all really deployed within one environment. Um, we have two pieces that work here. We have the Compose platform and services from IBM Cloud Data Services, but both of these are deploying through a soft layer infrastructure. So in, in, in practice, every service that we've deployed onto here can be co-located within the exact same data center, within the same environment, giving you that optimal performance and really mitigating any type of latency or delaying feedback across every piece of the state layer. And uh, again, just to reinforce, if we were to bring this back to the chart that we looked at before, we never had to pick those specific combinations of services if we look at this from the bucket point of view, and there are services that I haven't even included on this chart that come from the IBM catalog as well as the Compose catalog, uh, pick one from each and mix and match as appropriate. But really uh, what it comes down to is addressing the unique requirements to your company's uh, workloads and use cases. And Compose and IBM are both on hand to give you that type of guidance and, uh, and best practices around how to uh, integrate and combine these services. Uh, so with that, John, if uh, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take those now. Yeah, let me go ahead and pull up a screen real quick. I might, you might have to pass it back and forth, but let me just go ahead and pull up screen with some contact information. If anybody has questions generally for Compose uh, or about the webinar, you can send it to webinars.compose.com. Um, and then I have posted Chris's email address here as well if you have questions about the specific um, presentation. There were a couple questions. There were actually two about the components that you chose to display or chose to use in your example. Um, one is used Redis cache data coming in from the device. Are there other strategies for landing the data or other services that can use, be used in place of, of Redis? And the other question that was similar, which was, um, uh, let's see, the collection showed nine tools from Compose, <clears throat> and there's things like Hadoop and Spark and Big Insights, and why are we pushing, or why in this presentation are we pushing one service over another, um, say Big Insights for analytics opposed to Compose for analytics? 
Okay, cool. You, you might have to remind me of the second one. I'll uh, I'll address the first one um, now. So that was asking, uh, could you utilize in place of Redis something like Spark uh, to address that streaming component? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. They're, they're both really sort of, I think the question, both questions are really, why are we showing the tools that we have? Are there other things that could be used in place of those things? And I guess, you know, why would you use, I guess there's the Redis question about caching, and the other question is really about analytics and using big insights versus, say, Postgres or some other analytics uh, platform. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that those are both fair questions in that uh, it's in keeping with the philosophy that we have with this presentation, which is that in any type of multi-database design, if you're designing for a polyglot architecture, uh, you have a, a wealth of options available to you. It's really trying to narrow down specifically uh, I think across a number of criteria, what, what is important to you. And, and one of that criteria is, is platform. I think a lot of customers would appreciate being able to do this within one platform or at least as few platforms as possible to ease the workflow, um, have fewer environments to keep track of, and fewer points of uh, something going wrong. If, uh, if one vendor is managing all of it, it's certainly much easier to uh, standardize for that platform and not have to kind of change your mindset day to day or uh, emergency to emergency. So that's one thing. Um, when it comes down to the caching there, we, we did use Redis in that example as our initial caching front end. But if you're very well versed in something like Spark, uh, Spark of course has the Spark streaming engine as a part of that technology stack. Um, that could be, excuse me, utilized as well to uh, cache the data coming out of that VR headset or any type of IoT sensor. Uh, in this case, I think because we have the flexibility within the Compose platform to scale quite on demand and elastically, uh, and we're deploying that as a piece of this architecture, Redis makes a lot of sense to stand in front of a data layer or a streaming IoT layer that could be fairly bursty in terms of this VR headset. If we're working across multiple users or multiple demographics, um, there may be periods of time where data is coming at us faster than others in larger volumes or at faster throughput rates. Uh, we can scale Compose elastically and, and Redis elastically uh, to accommodate that so that we're never hit with too much throughput. Um, we'll scale it appropriately ahead of time, and then as that data grows towards that peak, we've already accommodated that um, and, and scaled very easily through the Compose layer uh, via Redis. Uh, to accommodate it. But of course, Spark could be utilized there as well. There's other caching layers um, also available within uh, Compose. Etcd could be used as a little bit of a in-memory cache. Uh, there's also other options through IBM or through AWS. So it's really up to the customer to choose what's appropriate. Uh, but again, I think being able to manage all this within a single data center and within generally just a single platform of Compose uh, that has a lot of value in itself. Um, John, can you remind me on the second question of big insights and... Uh, oh, big insights and in Postgres. I, I think it's the same idea, which is that I, I think your example showed one way that you could set things up, but there's there's options. So the question was, was really, uh, it's a collection of nine tools, I, I think that refers to Compose, just as useful as Hadoop and Spark, and big insights, and if so, why is IBM pushing big insights for analytics as opposed to compose for analytics? Okay, um, and that's something that we've we've had a, a number of questions around. For example, uh, would it be possible to bring Apache Spark into something like the Compose data layer? And Compose is actively uh, evaluating different offerings, uh, different open source technologies to add to the platform. Uh, we recently added SiloDB as well as MySQL, which SiloDB, of course, is, is relatively new as a, as a next generation approach to uh, Cassandra, essentially Cassandra written at the, the code level in C code. Uh, so that's relatively new, but MySQL has many, many years of, of pedigree and heritage behind it. it uh, so it's not new to the marketplace, but it's new to our catalog of offerings. And, and all that's gauged and measured uh, both by the interest that we see from our customer base, so the feedback that they give us, uh, looking for different solutions to bring to the platform. The Compose team will actively consider that, as well as evaluate these hands-on themselves, working within our orchestration framework to see if it's an appropriate fit. 
uh, for the composed data layer. So we're actively considering bringing new, for example, analytic pieces into our catalog as well as other services. Um, and in terms of like the negotiation between when to use IBM Big Insights or DashDB or Spark for analytics, again, I think a lot of it uh, boils down to what environments the customer is running already uh, and what their skill set and comfort level is with these technology pieces. Uh, a Big Insights developer, for example, is likely to be very deep in something like Java uh, and Java programming, but if you're a Spark developer and you went through university classes in the last five years, more likely than not, you're much more comfortable using Python or Scala or uh, you know, a, a much a different approach to programming than uh, a Java uh, a developer would be, for example. Um, so the decision between Spark and Big Insights, I think, comes down a lot to, of course, use cases, but also comfort level and skill set. So that's something that a customer uh, can, can easily dialogue with us about, IBM and Compose, to make that type of recommendation, as we said before. Um, having a chat about your data layer and your skill sets and comfort level can go a long way in terms of allowing us to scope for you uh, what the correct combination of services might be. Um, great. A couple other questions, which is, one is, uh, what is the best tool for integrating across all of these component services? Mm, that's, again, a, a, a good but open question. Um, Compose has uh, an open source technology uh, called Transporter that we put out on GitHub. Uh, that has connectors across pretty much every facet of the Compose catalog of services. So if you want to integrate between MongoDB and Elasticsearch, for example, we support that, as well as a, a multitude of other connection uh, configuration options. So that would be, I think, a recommendation for uh, an open source developer would be to, to jump onto Git and, uh, and, and do a poll on that, uh, on that service, set it up, and uh, configuration steps and all that are documented as part of our API. Um, so that would be a great option to use. But of course, IBM and other vendors have a multitude of connectors uh, as well as documentation from these open source vendors as to how to integrate with um, other components from the marketplace and the ecosystem. So a ton of options out there. Uh, I don't think there's one best, uh, uh, one, one fit all solution uh, to integrating across all of these. I'll throw out another one, by the way. Uh, we did a webinar on one called NIFI, uh, N-I-F-I, and there's a few blog posts on our, on our blogs about NIFI. Um, it was a tool that was actually originally developed by the NSA and uh, for integrating lots of different data components and um, worth checking out because it has a lot of characters already pre-built. Um, so there's lots of options, I, I, I would suppose. Um, uh, I guess last question is, um, there is an individual service path, sorry, I'm going to repeat this. There is an individual service purchase path as well as a catalog approach, correct? Yep, that would be the, the Compose public, which is our traditional path where you jump onto Compose.io and, and just select from the dashboard catalog there and spin up the service individually. In that case, you build based on uh, the size of your deployment, so how much data is behind it, and, and really that's a reflection of how much memory and RAM you've associated to it. So kind of a per database billing model or per service billing model. And then the other option is the Compose Enterprise path, uh, if you buy that IBM managed path, you get a combination of that infrastructure, which is set up for you, isolated for you ahead of time, as well as licensing to the full catalog. So any combination of service that you want to deploy um, or any number of those services, so long as they fit within that infrastructure that you purchased, um, you're free to, to mix and match those however you please. So two paths for, uh, for purchasing. Okay, um, one, one last question and then uh, I think we're done, which is when you say that composed services are available on IBM infrastructure, what exactly does that mean? And is it only available in software? Uh, great question. So uh, infrastructure at IBM is provided by software, but we have a platform as a service, which is Bluemix. Uh, you can jump onto bluemix.net. I think that type of environment will be very comfortable to any composed customer where really we have every uh, IBM cloud data service that's available on there, as well as services from other vendors, but also services from Compose. So if I'm just gonna hop back here to uh, our architecture overview, 
when you purchase Compose, uh, you have the option to interact with it through the Compose dashboard, and that would be the Compose.io web front page that most of our customers are familiar with. You can also provision identical services through the Compose Bluemix console. Um, so under Bluemix, there's tiles for each of those Compose services, Postgres, MySQL, etcd, that you can provision under Bluemix, which is IBM's platform as a service, and have that as part of the same environment uh, as those other uh, services that are part of Bluemix. And Bluemix, as, a, as an audience and, and what it caters to, is really catering to the developer, much in the same way as Compose. Um, and their philosophy uh, was really that mix and match idea where you have the best of IBM, but also the best of open source within a single platform. Um, so if you're buying Compose from IBM, you can stick with how you did it before, directly through Compose.io. You can deploy it through Bluemix, uh, which would be deploying it onto software as your infrastructure. But of course, we also still deploy to AWS and GCP. Um, so there's no, no real lock-in with our platform. We just offer many avenues for customers to get started and to trial it out. Um, and that trial point is interesting as well. Uh, if you want, uh, the Bluemix services of Compose are free to use up to a certain amount of space under Bluemix. Uh, and those go beyond a 30-day trial window. So if you sign up for Compose.io, you can get 30 days free across the entire catalog. Uh, I think that's probably the best path to get started. But if customers are already working on Bluemix, uh, just to raise awareness, that those services that you provision from the Bluemix console um, that are Compose-centric, uh, those also have an indefinite free-to-use period if you keep your data usage under a certain threshold, so beyond that 30-day window. So lots of avenues for people to get started. Uh, encourage folks to jump onto either or uh, to try us out. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for attending today's webinar. That concludes our presentation for today. If you can learn more about architecting and optimizing Compose hosted databases on our blogs, please go check out our blogs. And like I mentioned, we have a, a number of blogs on NiFi, which is the, the service that sort of allows you to move data, transport data between all the different data layers. Um, and if you haven't done so already, deploy a trial on Compose and trial or, or Bluemix and try all the services for yourself. And we will email everybody shortly with a link to today's presentation. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you for attending.